Welcome once again to Profiles. I'm Ed Highland. From his early days in Havana, Cuba, to an upbringing in Lima, Peru, and San Juan, Puerto Rico, Dr. Luis Martinez Fernandez's early life provided the foundation for his job today as director of the Latin American, Caribbean, and Latino Studies program at the University of Central Florida. With a PhD in history, Dr. Fernandez is the recipient of numerous awards as well as fellowships and has authored many articles and books. His current projects include a two-volume history of Cuba. Thanks so much for joining us on what I know is a very busy schedule for you. Thanks for having me. Wanted to talk a little bit first about Cuba. I had I had the the great honor of being able to go down there several years ago, and and I was in, entranced by the community, which was so diverse. It was at one time very modern, at the same time it was kind of a throwback to the 50s. Uh, but it seemed that the that the island was almost divided into into three era, eras, if you will, and that was you know pre Castro, Castro, and what might happen after Castro. Um, Kind of give us an idea of, of, from your upbringing, what you see happening in, in that area right now, and then we'll get into, you know, what's going on here now at UCF. Well, Cuba is a land of paradoxes. Uh, it's a it's a country, for example, that during the 19th century had was a rural society based on sugar production, yet at the same time it had a world class city in Havana which had the biggest theaters in the world, for example. So historically, we have found these sorts of contradictions within the island, and also the magic coming together of the various elements that have created Cuba. Um, the metaphor of the, the stew is often used to, to explain why Cuba is the way it is. We have, of course, an indigenous background, we have the Spanish uh, conquistadors and colonizers, and of course, uh, large numbers of Africans who were brought as slaves. And yet, within the Cuban context, there is a, an encounter which is referred to a, as transculturation. That is, these ingredients come together, preserve their, their flavors, but yet produce something new and exciting. And so much, uh, as you mentioned, of, of, of Cuba now is, 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 is kind of divided because it, when you go through like a Havana, you will see cars that, uh, at least the shells appear to be from the 1950s mm -hmm. and 60s, from the days when, uh, when, when the American government was still, mm -hmm. the Americans were still uh, there and doing business with Cuba. And uh, then you see some of the Russians from, from the influence uh, at mm -hmm. that point in time as well. Uh, you go back every year, I understand, and I've to see family. Have you seen the change? Are, are people ready for the, for the change, you think, that it's got to come at some point? Well, people are ready, uh, great measure because of this pent-up energy within the Cuban population. As, as you said, um, you know, the cars, it's a metaphor that I've often used. You have the 1950s big cars, which in Cuba are called almendrones, which means almonds because of the round shape. Everything in Cuba has a nickname. Then we have the vehicles from imported from the Soviet bloc during the 1970s. And what we're having now is, is, is really the return, although I think it never left the island, of, of very sharp distinctions between classes. And you have a ruling class that drives BMs and, and Lexuses and luxury cars. And then you have the masses who have gone to bicycles as, as a means of transportation. Well, one of the, 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 the tragedies, but at the same time, one of the, the benefits, if you will, of what's happened in Cuba is that uh, while it's a tragedy of, of Castro uh, being on the island, the, one of the benefits, if you will, is that many people like yourself have come to the United States and, and this nation has been enriched. And, and that has led over the years, basically, to the creation of a Latin American Studies program, people learning more about uh, not only Cuba, but also the other, other countries uh, of Latin America. Maybe uh, you could give us an idea more of, of the, the program which you head and, and where you hope to take it. Well, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, everybody brings to the table his or her own background, and that shapes them. For example, in my own case, the fact that from a very early age, I became uh, very, I gained an intimate knowledge of what a revolution is, what exile is, what military coup is, as, as I witnessed one in, in Peru as, as a young boy, what emigration means. And, and so I had a, a, a very, very close encounters with history. And that explains why I'm a historian. The fact that I lived in these various societies, in, in, in a great measure, shaped me to be a a historian who's a comparative historian. And um, I think the, the program that we're, that we're running in a way reflects these 
diverse experiences that I had and the direction that I'm trying to, to give it. The program is very special. I think it is perhaps the only one in the nation that combines these three elements, Latin America, the Caribbean, and Latinos in the United States. There are programs out there that include Latin America and the Caribbean. There are programs that include Latinos and Latin America. Others are Latino alone. But ours has, has that combination, and it allows our students to um, get a minor in that area with the richness of these uh, various um, themes, if you will, or parts of the world. And we're uh, also working towards the major, which uh, uh, the bachelor's degree in Latin American studies at UCF should be available uh, for students to begin, say, in March of two 2007. Which would be a big step for the program as yes. well. Yes. And especially the Latino area is, is, is in such demand. Latino meaning the study and the teaching and learning about Hispanic populations in the United States. As you know, it is a very large component of the Florida population. Here in Central Florida, we're talking about 20%. Uh, within Orange County, it's closer to 25%. It is rapidly growing, rapidly becoming diverse, that is with, with a large influx of uh, immigrants from Venezuela, for example, uh, Colombia, not just the traditional immigrants uh, from Puerto Rico and from Cuba, which had been in the area for, for the longest time. Does, does it make it more difficult or easier to have so many different elements of, of the Latin American culture? As you mentioned, we have the Puerto Ricans, uh, mm -hmm. uh, then the folks uh, who have come from Cuba. We have many different uh, uh, elements of the culture who are mm -hmm. coming in, uh, but yet they all ha have and retain their own identities. And that, that's right, and that's one of the things that we try to promote through the program's activities, for example. First of all, the notion that Latin America is a is a common area where all people share the, the same culture. Uh, that's not true. I mean, we don't expect that of Europe, and we don't talk about a European culture as such. In the same way, Latin America is very diverse, and there's enormous diversity wi within the countries of Latin America. Take Peru, for example. Peru, geographically, is a very complex nation with three main areas, the coastal, the, the high mountains, and then uh, further east, the, the jungles. And each of these regions has produced very rich cultures. And it's one thing to look at, say, Cusco in the highlands and, and Lima, Peru, which are worlds apart, literally. And somebody who lives in Cusco is more likely to speak Quechua, which is a native language, than somebody who lives in Lima, who's, in order to survive, must speak Spanish. So there's an enormous diversity within the region and also within the countries. and. Unfortunately, the, the caricature of Latin America does not allow for us to always be aware of the richness and the diversity. How would you describe your, uh, your average student, the average uh, student who's coming in now, perhaps minoring in, in Latin American studies? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I would say that Latin America, for obvious reasons, um, is really the future of this country. As we see the formation of European blocs, as we th see the formation of other parts of the world. Uh, even though his, uh, for the past 10 years or so, actually I would say for the past 20 years or so, Latin America hasn't really been the focus of U.S. foreign policy, foreign investment, and so on, um, yet I see Latin America as the future. And it's interesting to see how um, political change in, in terms of the the attitudes of the United States towards the region and how the region is uh, gradually moving towards the left politically with so many of the governments uh, being uh, led or ruled by politicians who are center left or left in some cases, as is the case in Venezuela okay. under Hugo Chavez. Do, do you see your students as, as many of them having Hispanic roots, or do you see a, a pretty much broad spectrum of students coming into the program? I would say that uh, the Hispanic students are certainly a minority, say, with, within the classes that I teach. Mm -hmm. Many students are attracted to these kinds of courses and, and the program because they realize that Spanish, for example, is the, is the language of the future. I mean, increasingly, it's, in, it's increasingly important for students to know that language in order to function and succeed in an increasingly globalized world. So there's that recognition. But also, uh, it's not just the language, but the culture. 
to gain an understanding about the, the cultural differences between uh, one society, say the United States, and other countries in Latin America, and to try to understand the roots of that. Um, say, business behaviors as they are um, carried out in Latin America are different from some of the business behaviors in the United States mm -hmm. and it makes perfect sense because we're talking about two cultures. Now, the expectation that a Mexican businessman will change his ways or her ways uh, is not a realistic one. Um, why, why should they? So the key is really to understand, um, to understand the culture. And as you gain an understanding, you're better able to work with that culture, not just dismiss uh, certain practices as you know, just wanting to be late. There's a logic to being late, and uh, of course, uh, being on time is not a is not a universal value. And sometimes we think it is because it is a very important value in this country. Mm -hmm. But a businessman may be late because he or she had a previous meeting. And it would not it would have been uh, disrespectful to end the meeting at the time when it was supposed to to end. Why? Because that person may have been giving his or her full attention to the person that was there at the time and not looking at the watch. So, I think the the understanding of the culture is is very important to to avoid um, misunderstandings and to engage in better partnerships. Sure, the protocols have to be understood before you can have an effective dialogue. That's right. Now, I understand the program also is going to uh, basically be reaching out. Many times programs or classes uh, are, are somewhat confined to the university uh, element or atmosphere, mm -hmm. but uh, you're actually going to take this out into the community a little bit more. Yes, it's, um, it's something that even if, if I didn't want to do, would happen. Why? Because there's a large Hispanic population out there. And by the way, our program is not on Hispanics for Hispanics. Our program is on Hispanics for everybody. Um, but there's a large population out there, uh, over 20 percent of the, uh, the Central Florida population is Hispanic and that's rapidly growing. And it's a population that oftentimes feels neglected, feels intimidated by some of the mainstream institutions such as museums, for example, such as universities. and it is important to, to have outreach efforts to send the message, which is the, the just message and the right message. University of Central Florida is also yours. It, it, it does not belong to, say, the mainstream. It belongs to a new mainstream, and, and Latinos, Hispanics have reshaped that, that new mainstream in the region. Therefore, some of the things that are keeping us very busy have to do with um, community outreach activities. Now, how, how do we do that? Well, we must remember that our role, first and foremost, is an academic one. It has to do with education. It has to do with a sound curriculum. And there are creative ways where you can relate with a community. For example, next semester in the fall of 2005, the University of Central Florida will be offering, for the first time in its history, a History of Puerto Rico course. Now, that's very important. Uh, many of our students are Hispanics. I would say it's about 13 percent. Uh, over half of them are from Puerto Rico. So we're talking as a natural audience for that sort of course. And again, it's not just for Puerto Ricanos that we're offering it. Um, what we're doing in, in terms of an outreach effort is to have five special courses, which will be, uh, I should say, five special lectures that will be held outside of UCF, closer the, to the community, we're bringing experts from Puerto Rico to give those talks, and it's a way in which, in a, in a, in a different context, the university reaches the, the people. Mm -hmm. and, and those kinds of bonds and linkages really have enormous fruits uh, for years to come. You are also going to be uh, having, uh, uh, in the fall, the, the a, a Latin summit, if you will, basically a, a bringing together. Tell us a little bit about this, because this this is working on the on the cultural side of it as well, with with arts and music. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. We're uh, as a humanities and social sciences program. It's interdisciplinary. We're supposed, and and we we actually do that. We're supposed to cover a variety of disciplines. Unlike history, for example, which is one discipline, uh, we have many disciplines that that we uh, pursue. We have um, the arts, 
music, for example. We've done a lot in, in that area. We have history, we have literature, we have communications. And one of the things, one of the areas that really interests us, in part because of the enormous thirst for this kind of activity, uh, has to do with the arts. Music brings people together. We just had a major event with uh, uh, our professor Eladio Charron, and you should have seen how that big auditorium overflowed. Pe people were outside. It had to do with some Latin American music, beautiful uh, compositions that were played uh, by our, our, our symphony orchestra at the, at the university. The arts, the plastic arts, theater. So what we're doing is we're a small program. We can't do everything. We don't have the resources to do everything, but we're working very hard to bring on board various departments from the university. And we already have commitments from music, film, art, English, um, theater, that they will be putting together some special Latin America focused event so that we as a program can include that under the umbrella of the first Latin American Arts Festival prepared or produced by the University of Central Florida. I'll just say that's something that, that just hasn't happened here, which, which almost seems odd in the sense that we do have such a, a large and rapidly growing Hispanic population. And yet now we're just getting together and having this, this wonderful event, cultural Well, event. this is the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm so fortunate that I came here at this time because this is really the time when everything that had been pent up in terms of interest uh, and desires to learn more about Latin America, these things have kind of exploded all of a sudden. For example, the Greater Orlando Chamber of Commerce, not the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, but the Greater Orlando Chamber of Commerce, has dedicated three years in a row a summit that deals with Hispanic themes. We just had the first one. Two more are coming. Uh, we had the first Latin American Film Festival mm -hmm. at, at DMAC, uh, downtown Orlando. Um, we have the, the emergence of a new uh, Spanish language newspaper from Puerto Rico. All of these things are happening at the same time. The, the foundation of our program now and its expansion, these things are happening uh, not, because, not because individuals like myself are wanting to make them happen. It's because the time is ripe, the need is there, and all of that makes our job much, much easier. I may have just pulled this out of the air, but I got to thinking about the uh, uh, the elements in Central Florida which kind of drive our economy, which is the tourism hospitality industry. And we have many visitors uh, who, who come from, from mm -hmm. Latin America. We also have many people from Latin America who, who work in the tourism industry. Uh, is, is this something, an area that you're into or perhaps thinking about getting into, working uh, with businesses um, and uh, in particular the hospitality industry is what comes to my mind. Yes, we're working very closely with a variety of, of segments of society. One outreach uh, effort has to do with the community, as I mentioned. We're, wor we're working closely with government and we're partnering with them in a variety of events that we're putting together. We're working with bus businesses. I have a close links with uh, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce as well as the Greater Orlando Chamber of Commerce. We're really open to working with everybody. This is, this is not an isolated effort within the academia, within the academy. Uh, in order for us to have a greater impact, we need to be open to dialogues with these various segments of society, grassroots organizations as well. Um, so I, I would say yes, mm -hmm. definitely. You mentioned tourism, and uh, we have within our program three professors from the Rosen School of Hospitality. Uh, one of them is a Caribbeanist, uh, Ro Robertico Croes, and we're working closely with him to put together events. And what that means is that we're not focusing on purely academic matters. We're focusing on events that have to do with realities, that have to do with the, with the future of Central Florida, the future of the country. And at the heart of the future of Central Florida and the country is uh, a better understanding of Latin America, mm -hmm. the Caribbean, and those Hispanics and Latinos who already live here. You are a, a relatively young program. Uh, you're um, relatively uh, small as far as staffing and such. 
Where would you like to see the program go? Uh, as you said, the, uh, the, the population of Central Florida, 20% uh, I believe in, in the immediate area is, is Hispanic or has Hispanic roots and connections. And, and it would seem that you would be growing almost as fast as the population just to, just to keep up with the many different yes. things that are happening. Well, this is a good start, and I'm glad the University of Central Florida administration recognized that this had to be done, and in order to do it well, the resources had to be made available. Now, neither the administration nor myself were aware of the fact that th the potential was so great and that within one year we would be able to accomplish so much, not just because of our efforts, but because of the, uh, of the atmosphere and the environment that surrounds us that is really partnering with us in, in many regards. I think it's important to have say, and, and these are our long-term plans, a Latin American and Latino arts center, a space where uh, theater groups can explore and experiment in, in various uh, Latin American or Latino theatrical pieces, mm -hmm. where we could have a gallery open to, uh, to the community, but also open to uh, some of the artists, painters, sculptors that may not necessarily gain an entrance in other spaces, uh, to have concerts. Um, these things are very important. So along the lines of our future plans and dreams, that's one of them. But also because of the enormous need that we sense, I think that UCF should uh, move forward in the direction of establishing a Latino Studies Center where we have uh, investigators, where we have a collection of historical, sociological materials that, that are accessible to the university community, but it can also be accessible to other members of, of, of the community. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are two, two of the, we need to have a vision, and the vision includes um, big plans about a research center and about a, a Latin American arts center as well. When, when, when you start working on, on not only the big plans but also the, the immediate plans, the curriculum uh, for, for the program, uh, which is a minor now, as you mentioned, hoping uh, to, to build it into a, to a, a major as well at UCF, what, where, where do you draw on that? I mean, are you essentially creating something from scratch has, or has it been done before in other places and, and we're able to, to say, well, this would work for us and this, mm -hmm. this may or may not work for us? How, how do you build the program? Yes, we're in the midst of that precisely. Um, we can't reinvent the wheel. There are many departments, programs dealing with Latin America, the Caribbean, Latino studies that have been in place for, in some cases, o over a hundred years. Well, maybe not that much, but, but the interest in these fields has been in place uh, for a long time at places like Berkeley, Harvard. Harvard has a Latin American studies uh, program with a staff that is, is huge in the resources that they have. So we can't be a Harvard, of course. But um, but we can what we can do is take a look at the various models that are used elsewhere, places like the University of Florida, places like the University of Miami, places like Tulane, which have established programs in Latin America. But I think it's important to recognize that this region in particular has special needs and special potentials. And what I'm referring to is, for example, the, the importance of understanding the Latino experience in the region by recognizing that it is different from the Latino experience elsewhere. A Latino Studies Center in New York City, for example, has its long history, a focus predominantly on Puerto Rico, a focus predominantly on, on labor migration, on, 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 the, on the working classes and the marginal. A Cuban Studies program in, in Miami has its own uh, focus focusing on, on, on exile, the, the process of emigration, focusing on, on a largely middle class experience for, for Cuban Americans and, or Cubans in this country. Orlando and the greater, uh, the greater Orlando area and Central Florida for that, for that matter is different. We, it's, a, it's, a, it's a newer experience. It's an experience that brings different components um, and the mix is different. Mm -hmm. Therefore, in a place like Orlando, even though Puerto Ricans are the majority of Hispanics, perhaps a half or so, that's different from, say, New York City, where they're very strongly predominant. What does, what does that mean? It means that a politician in New York City can run for office in a way ignoring 
some of the other Hispanic groups. That can't happen here in Central Florida. So the area is different, and therefore it needs to be studied from a different perspective, not the traditional models, and recognizing that because the area is different, it can shed light on the broader Hispanic experience in the United States and, and make the case, well, the Hispanic experience is not necessarily the, the Chicano or Mexican-American experience in, say, Texas, mm -hmm. or the Puerto Rican experience in New York, or the Cuban experience in Miami. I think, in, 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 in fact, that our experience here in Central Florida is the future, as Miami, as New York, as places like Austin become increasingly diverse in terms of the Hispanic population, I think we are in, in fact ahead of the times and therefore our program could play a leading role in, in shedding light over the Hispanic nation of the future within this nation. Because we have diversity that's not, for lack of a better term, too unbalanced. That's right. We have just the many elements. And that kind of is almost where we started, isn't it? Talking about the different elements uh, and all the richness that is brought in from, from the many countries. Uh, Central Florida has become kind of a, uh, a mixing pot, if you will, of, of Latin American uh, families and cultures, uh, while each has retained their own identities. And, and, and you mentioned politics as well. It becomes difficult for someone to, to come up who's a Cubano or Puerto Rican uh, and, and say, well, we should be united because we all speak Spanish. I mean, that becomes an overriding theme. Yes. And uh, it's been an interesting uh, process to watch as Central Florida continues it to grow is. with its Latin American population. I want to thank you so much for coming by and sharing a, a, a wealth of information. We know there is so much more. And uh, we certainly want you to come back uh, and we'll talk more about the summit that'll be coming up. And also, uh, as the program uh, grows toward that, uh, that major, I think we're gonna have much more to talk about as well in terms of the curriculum and, uh, and what you have to offer through UCF. Anytime. Thank you. Dr. Luis Martinez-Fernandez, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for another edition of Profiles. I'm Ed Hyland. Thanks for joining us.